what an impossible act to follow. Um, so, I'm, instead of jumping back 50 years, we can only j I can only jump in at about, wait, after 25 years. But before I knew what people were going to talk about, I thought about the 50 years thing. And It's gone, I think. People have mentioned it a bit this morning. But 25 years ago only, the internet didn't exist, hardly. It's, so people are talking about 50 years ago, and there's funny pictures of John with his flared trousers and mm -hmm. things. And people don't realize that even 25 years ago, for computing and programming, was life on another planet already. It really was. Think you hear about a machine with 384k and something. Oh yeah, that's small. It's not small, it's totally unbelievable. This thing that is running the presentation and everything, it has, what is it, 64 gigabytes. It's, it's, um, it's beyond another planet. Think what you could have done with APL back then on, on one of these, running a, a worldwide time sharing service on one of these <laughs> things. And it was when I was thinking about that that I started to think about um, this, well, K and Q, the languages I work with from KX. This, as Morton and Gita have kindly invited me to turn here to, to give my version or my, my side of the story. And I realized that there are lots of things that over the 25 years and over the 50 years that were very small decisions, like John deciding would he sell his house or not. Small things that you could have decided something slightly different and it would have had a totally different effect. And even with, well, with APL and K and Q, APL made one, what looks like, uh, with hindsight, arbitrary decision and went galloping off that way. And we chose something different and went in another direction. And at the time that was small, but it had a knock-on effect, which had a knock-on effect, which had a knock-on effect, which meant that there's no way we could come back together again. And so people tend to look at the array languages as being a little dark corner under the stairs somewhere, when in fact it's already a wide palette of interesting, conflicting ways of doing things, not just conflicting with an APL, but with K and Q and J, there's a whole pile of things there. And like well, Aaron's talk yesterday, just being able to compile things, it's, there's an enormously wide array of, work, of, of, of things people could be doing. And this, I saw just a few weeks ago, reminded me that our work is not finished yet. That notation is such a crock of shit, it really is. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's useless, and we've been trying now. I mean, you've been trying 50 years, we've been trying 25 years. It's uh, just no hope for it. <coughs> we've got stuff to do. It, we're not celebrating that, okay, well, we've done all this work, things worked out pretty well, and now we can all go and have dinner this evening and celebrate and go home with a job well done. We're not quite there yet. This one, for instance, the, <laughs> there is some education. <laughs> there's some education to be done. <laughs> and just the... Just the general attitude to computers, quite apart from array programming and stuff like that. There is, people don't appreciate what people are doing or can do with computers, what's difficult to do, what's easy. And then within the programming community, people don't appreciate what clever things we've done or that there are different ways of doing the same things. That there isn't, what, the Java way and slight changes, or even just scalar programming. People are just completely hypnotized and stuck in that nonsense. And over the 50 years, we've built up a whole pile of junk and nonsense 
that if we were to go back and do it again, then things would be slightly different, I think. And I was thinking of this uh, walking a, a few days a few yeah, a few days ago that it's really there are these windy paths that go off and you end up somewhere wildly different. And it's all little tiny choices made for um, ridiculous reasons. And so what I wanted to talk about, because it's impossible to follow people like them, was some of these choices that we made that were different from the choices APL made and what consequences they had. And maybe it's interesting for you to realize that actually yeah, within the APL world, it was possible to go differently. And some uh, we think will be better. Some we would mumble and change the topic and discuss the weather if we thought that we'd made a better choice or not. I leave it up to you to work out which. So one good example is those who know Kay or have been following our Looney Adventures know that there are lots of different versions. And the first one, Arthur pointed out when I was talking about this a week or so ago with him, that it stayed pretty standard, although we don't have the crazy character set, although it was something Bob said years ago that, yeah, okay, well, things like Jay, we lose the character set for now, but you wait and see, it'll be back with, with Unicode one day. And I forget how you said it exactly, but I thought, yeah, that's probably right, that's going to be, and so we got that one wrong. I think we can abandon all hope of that. So we are stuck with the loony character set on the US keyboard, which is a real problem for me because I use the Swiss keyboard. So some of the keys that are readily available that fall under your thumb don't. It's the right hand side out with shift and then up to the, uh, the number line. Sorry. And this is, uh, no, this. wait, <laughs> you can read it now, it's there, but I, I wanted the the thing about the, the different versions. So the, the author said that the only character we've changed, because we have so few of them, is the, well, the APL and symbol, the hat, which with the initial version of K, that was power, so exponent, because that was for the simple reason that our what, domain there was fixed income, where it made a lot of sense to have power as uh, one of the primitives, as we had so few primitives to go around and star was already taken. And then with K4, that's our current official version, then because that's more, well, it's a database and a programming language, and a dessert topping and a floor wax, and <laughs> it's uh, fill, and so either monadic fill, which just returns you a Boolean list of where there's a null, and I'll get to nulls a bit later, and Roger can run from the room, and Dyadic is the thing you replace the fills with, which is really valuable for databases, completely pointless for, um, for fixed income, say. And in our research version, well, pretty, uh, compared to other uses of it. Remember, these are very scarce symbols. We don't have any combinations like J. We are stuck with just what's on the American keyboard. And with our research version of K, so that's K6 this week, um, it's set difference, and so that, but that's the only one that moves around. And the other thing that's determined it over the years is performance, the same as we've all been hitting on things. It's just you have things you would do for aesthetic reasons, but then there's a whole pile of stuff that somebody is shouting and yelling, so you just have to go and fix it and you do appalling things to the internals because if you do it in the theologically correct version, so that you would follow in the Gospel of Matthew or whatever, then you, you will not cut these corners or you will not throw this memory away before you really can safely do it. But when someone is shouting for it to be faster, you just do it. So one of the first big changes, I think, that I noticed when I came to K years ago was that we don't do workspaces. And this is one of these things when, you know, well that sounds like that's not so big, that's sort of bookkeeping, that's bean counting, what's the issue there? But it's actually enormous, it had consequences over years for us because 
As we don't have workspaces, there aren't old saved copies of the code. Every time you start a new KDP Plus, a queue session, you load up ASCII scripts and you start from scratch again. There is no legacy workspaces of, of different sizes and all this stuff that you have to follow. So we bypass that. It means moving to another uh, even endianness or another architecture or bigger machines, smaller machines, all these things. We don't care. It's just text files. And so that seems like a tiny choice, but that's one of these ones that had enormous consequences for us because every time uh, we talk with the dialogue people, one of the things that we are appalled at is the legacy support you have to have, which is fantastic, of course. It's an enormous amount of work for the internals and as a convenience to the end users. But it must be an absolute nightmare to look after. Whereas we could just say, oh, remember that version of Plus? Mistake. It's gone. Sorry. <laughs> and that's the end of it. The same with um, porting to uh, new applications. It's it's just text files, because again, the same way as there's no saved state, there's no saved weird characters either. It was completely vanilla. It's just really simple. It allows our executable to be still something like 300K for the whole thing, because we just throw things away continually, rigorously. Related to that, was just the whole GUI stuff. Because the early versions of K did have a GUI. And it was pretty nice for its time. It's just embarrassing now. I, I did find one or two pictures of it, and I thought, no, you're in this, you can't talk about how you had a pretty neat GUI and show that thing on the screen as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left that. But at the, the time when it was in its sort of demise then, it was still in the days of X Windows, which was, I mean, if you think X Org is awful, then X Windows, Jesus Christ. Uh, we had more bugs with the X Windows, with the GUI code, than we did for the whole rest of K and Windows and all the other platforms put together. Such a rubbish. And so Arthur's solution was just a typically Arthur one with um, KDB Plus. So GUIs, yeah, we don't do GUIs. We just don't have one. The, our GUI is the command prompt. And so we had our version, our flavor of GUI that people just had to put up with. So, yeah, so we dealt with the problem our way. I want to whine about quad IO. People who know me know I always do this. I can't resist the chance to get at Quad.io. And I was talking to Arthur about this as well not long ago, and he said that as he remembers it, Ken wanted to have Quad.io 0 only as well, but had to do Quad.io 1 because of Fortran for compatibility. People insisted that he put it in. He didn't want to do it. He wanted Quad.io 0 as well. And so there's been these arguments for years ever since about Quad IO. And I think the problem is not Quad IO 1 or Quad IO 0. I think the problem is just that there's a choice. There's, it just shouldn't be there. If people had picked Quad IO 2, then yeah, there would have been some work involved. But it would be better than allowing you to have different values at different levels of the stack and trying to debug it and work out what were they doing here. And it's a bit the same thing to a lesser extent because there's more justification with things like Quad CT. Just as soon as you allow someone the freedom to set multiple values, you just make life and the code much more difficult. So again, the recurring theme, we solved that by not having it. We just have quad IO zero. There is a thing like quad CT, but it's not surface to the user at all. We do some stuff behind the scenes, but it's it's not as powerful and it's not as 
it, we throw something away, we lose something compared to APL, but we did simplify it a lot. The next area is Booleans, and people have said, I mean, you've had talks here pointing out beautiful algorithms. When I was talking about this to Leslie Goldsmith, who some of you all remember from uh, Ipsa days, uh, a few days ago, he said that the one thing he misses using Q, now K and Q, are the beautiful Boolean algorithms and all the work you could do with that. Because we have Booleans, but we don't have bit Booleans, and we haven't optimized the system for them at all. <laughs> and that's one of these areas where, again, it had enormous knock-ons that we don't have the bit booleans. So we, for things like uh, when we do with a select constraint, select from, so fields from, table, where, whatever, you would expect that that where is playing with booleans because that would be great. Um, that would be very small and you can quickly find the first few elements. But we don't. We have in the indices of the places where we've hit things. Which is fine if you're retrieving very sparse data. It's not so fine if you're doing something like give me the locations in a hundred billion records of everywhere where the stock symbol is MSFT, say. So one of these knock-on effects was, we, well, a knock-on that we got hit by was when we shifted a few years ago to having 64-bit integers everywhere, so sort of wall-to-wall 64-bit. Those constraints could be pretty big. So this list of all MSFTs, it was a list. It started here, and it was every single one for the next 100,000. What a waste of space and time that was. So the knock-on that was hidden from users, but which had major consequences again, was that we did put in... Uh, arithmetic progression vectors. Well, not clever ones, not with a range or anything, just a simple start point and, and length. Ah, oh, this stupid thing. Um. But we didn't make that available to users again. That's just hidden away inside. But it was a major change to the interpreter. I hardly dare touch this thing in case it, it jumps on again. Um. The next area that's different from APL is the use of symbols. And this is a thing that J has them, I think. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think APL does. Or do you? Yeah. And this is one of the areas that's made code so much more elegant and simple to write. You can just do output equals printer or something, or not. I mean, you can do it. You can get around it in APL, you have a variable called printer, and you've got the 17.3 in it or something, and then you check if output equals printer, and you can tell. But it's not as simple as having symbols, which are just immutable strings. And the big deal with them, which people don't realize properly, is that they're immutable strings, but they're also scalars. That's the big deal. So you can see how many have you got, and you can have a symbol per row in a table or things like that. It's not, it's not wavy strings. This was unexpectedly, it's the same point with timestamps, because we have nanosecond timestamps, because uh, uh, this, that seems like the sensible thing to do. It was funny listening to Bob this morning, I hadn't realized just how far back this goes. You wouldn't believe how much through the weeds people have been in the meantime since then. It's, uh, most databases, not only do they store their timestamps, God help us, as character strings, but they also store them as character strings with millisecond precision, and that's all. So having nanosecond timestamps as basic data types is fantastic, but the big thing compared to APL, which makes them, in my opinion, much better, is that it's a scalar again. It's one number. It's not a list of the year, the month, the day, the hour, the minute, the second. So it's much easier to manipulate. You can pull the bits out again, but it's a scalar, so you can just have a column of the timestamp that goes with the thing, the value. The 
the next difference is dictionaries, which they started off, that was quite funny. That it was again part of the GUI. We had dictionaries because it was a very elegant way of being able to keep foreground color, background color, font, um, a few other attributes. So what, up to a dozen things. Unfortunately, people found dictionaries were just great and were stuffing hundreds of millions of things in them with all the performance problems that caused. And so we realized actually, the dictionaries are neat. They're too good to be wasting on the GUI that we actually don't even have anymore anyway. So when we junked GUIs, we kept dictionaries. And that's the way that we do things like tables, so SQL tables. A record in a database is a dictionary where there's the key is the name of the thing and then the value. So that maps nicely. And then the table is just the field name and then the list of all the values. So it's, it's a beautiful mapping, very, very simple, that you can only really do with, well, with an array programming language. If you don't have some, the concept of arrays, you don't are able to just jam all the values in after the column name. <coughs> this is one for Roger. Because of databases, we had to do nulls. And um, while we were there, then we thought we might as well have infinities as well. And these are, infinities particularly, are you can't do lots of clever arithmetic with it. It's just a placeholder that this is an infinity. It's sort of a, as a result from a calculation sometimes. But having empties is more useful than people realize. Here's something from the Tate. Uh, collection, an empty page from Turner's sketchbook. Somebody thinks this empty is really quite valuable. <laughs> the trouble with finding pictures like this on the internet is you sometimes can't find the article that went with them. So I don't know what the imbecilic story is behind this. And, <laughs> and more importantly, if I can buy a copy. But but the big benefit people don't realize of having nulls and, and <laughs> infinities is that having nulls means that we don't stop as often as you do. If we have a divide by zero or things like that, then we can just stuff in an infinity. Or if some values, if an error happens, we can just stuff a null in there. And so let's say 17 elements of a 100 billion element array have nulls stuck in there because the, the answer had no meaning. But we aren't stopping everything going. We're just saying, OK, some nonsense in here, but sorry, we're busy. We'll carry right on again. And that's been an enormous benefit for us as well. Just stuff goes wrong, well, for other reasons, basically. One of the other data types we have that's treated differently from APL is functions. Functions are no different. We can just have matrices of them and especially this unexpected bonus was because they're just data for RPC you just can shove them around from one process to another just as easily as sending a list of integers or sending a character string there's no work no extra work involved we made some um, outrageous decisions about what uh, the scope was and things like that, that people complain about. But the benefit is that we don't have to be passing around contexts and things with the functions. It's Our implementation is really, really basic and simple, but it's allowed us to have RPC and to allow people writing systems with thousands of communicating processes much more simply than most other systems would allow. But the thing Arthur is proudest of, he says still, is that we don't just have a left argument and a right argument. From the beginning, we can have up to eight parameters, which led to interesting things with amend and reduce and scan and stuff like that, and how you apply at depth, all this sort of stuff. But the nicest thing from it that he likes most is just this thing on the left there, that 
that syntax is exactly the same as indexing into an array. So the distinction between applying an index to a function, well, not an index, but uh, applying parameters to a function and applying parameters to an array is exactly the same. You can't tell what you're doing it to. The other thing I mentioned earlier a bit was just about the code, the, that we don't have the weird symbols, although we've really hobbled ourselves with that by not allowing us to have so many symbols and having to do shuffling around. We didn't even go the route that Jay went of having digrams or trigrams. We just had to stick with the simple ones. But what that got us in earlier years, now it's not such a thing with um, Unicode, but that got us editors with color syntax. It got us diff programs that worked. It got us change control using the run of the mill nonsense, that whatever there was. We didn't have to have special solutions, which meant that we were able to integrate our code into a what an enterprisey air much more easily. Our speciality, but we could at least put it in the change control system, and we could write books and things like that more easily. It was it didn't need the special typesetting or the producing papers in uppercase only. We could just write the code. People couldn't read it easily afterwards necessarily, but uh, we could do it. Last point was that the main point, uh, the main thing, if you like, at the core of K and Q is we evaluate then parse trees, so bytecodes, of course, but we, it's, there's not there is an equivalent of execute, but that's really a poor relation. Typically, people strip things down to parse trees and evaluate the parse tree. And that's meant that it's much easier for us to write DSLs on top and to have um, much simpler security checking on what people are doing. It's, it's a much more elegant solution of pushing that stuff up towards the user. So now to finish, what I wanted was to say that th there is one thing to learn from this a bit. And it's that these, these tiny changes, uh, small changes when you ask Morton, couldn't he just quickly add this? Or can't you just make this small change? These things are tiny changes, but they actually have enormous consequences that you can unwind again afterwards. So it's, it's both at the pestering Morton level and even writing your own systems. All the time you spend up front because you have an elegant notation, something like APL or, or J or K or any of them. As it's a tool for thought, then you know, sort of for God's sake, use it and think three times before programming once. <laughs> and to, to avoid the messes you get into later. So that's, that's the sermon for the day, and uh, um, <laughs> that's it. I don't Simon, thank you very much. Now that, of course, we do have Unicode everywhere, and we yeah. have keyboard emulators for Turkish and Greek and Cyrillic and, and Japanese commonly in use, are you not tempted? Are you not tempted to leave the reserved words and go back to those elegant, beautiful symbols? I've already told Aaron I want one of those T-shirts. Where, where is he? I, I think the symbols are beautiful. I would love to start using them again. That was the thing that sold me on APL years ago at, at IP Sharp when I first saw it. I, can't, I would love to be able to say I remembered the expression, but I can't. But um, it was just that uh, you can just do just this with these uh, beautiful symbols on, again, at that time, with the type walls, where even the imprint on the paper was, very, was done properly. It was nicely inked and everything. It was, it was beautiful. 
the fact that the AJ 832s later would go f spinning the symbols off around the room if you're printing fast is neither here nor there. But the early golf ball things, uh, that they printed beautiful code. I had a friend in Germany who was pretty much deaf in one ear because he said he always insisted that was too many years of being too near the printer, uh, of the, the type ball printer. I guess a, sub a subject which hasn't been explored enough, the way a, an aesthetic sense and a search for elegance has driven the technology in our world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but please thank Simon Gold and <laughs>